Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hey, Baha'i Blogcast, it's me, Rain Wilson, and I am super duper thrilled to be speaking to one of my all-time Baha'i heroes, not just a Baha'i hero, human being hero, uh, Kevin Locke, who is, uh, I don't even know how to introduce him. I was asking Kevin earlier, like, how do I introduce you? You have so many incredible things that you've done in your life. I mean, he's best known as a world-famous hoop dancer, a flute player, Native American in the... Lakota tribe. And Kevin, I have so many questions for you. Let's just get going. How are you doing, Kevin? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks so much. Well, thanks for, for being a part of this. And, uh, and you're on the phone with me now from Florida. Is that right? Yes, I'm here right now in Florida. What, what, do you, what are you doing? Just trying, trying the seafood or checking out the swamps or what? Well, you know, um, uh, since the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens, I just make myself at home anywhere everywhere but uh, you know all my stuff is in south dakota so you're from standing rock can you tell us a little bit about that like what is remember kevin we have a uh, not just an american audience this is a worldwide audience for this podcast of baha'is and friends of baha'is from all over the globe so someone might be listening in from australia or iceland or singapore or something like that so uh, some of the listeners may know almost nothing about Native American life or culture other than what they saw in a Kevin Costner movie. So would l- really love for you to fill us in, but what's life like at Standing Rock? And then all of a sudden Standing Rock has been front page news for the last year. And, um, and what's that like? And tell us about your, your Native uh, tribe, please. Okay. Well, you know, uh, South Dakota is, um, is uh, listed or considered a flyover state. So it's off the main grid in terms of like communication and transportation. And so basically people just look out over from like 35,000 feet and, and, and look down. And if they're going at night, they don't see any, any kind of lights going on down there because of the sparse population. But, but uh, where I reside is uh, Wakfala, which is one of eight districts at Standing Rock. And there's uh, nine reservation communities in South Dakota. And some of them are quite large geographically. And I think we were, everything was pretty anonymous there in terms of, you know, national or international headlines until about a year ago when a group of young people decided to take a stand against um, this this eminent pipeline coming across the uh, uh, tribal territory. And it very quickly became a flashpoint or lightning rod for all kinds of different concerns, not just the uh, protection of the Missouri River, but also uh, like tr- tribal sovereignty, the indigenous voice on a uh, global scene, uh, global warming, uh, alternative energy, all sorts of different issues. Uh, it became like the, uh, the the lightning rod that attracted these concerns, not just uh, nationally, but internationally as well. People came from all over the world. Now, obviously, as Baha'is, we try and stay out of politics, especially partisan politics, but we are very involved in um, local social justice issues and national Mm -hmm. and international social justice issues and environmental issues and um, involved in that way. How what what is your what is your take on this? Because I know that everything in the United States these days quickly becomes a partisan issue um, as much as it becomes anything else. But do you see this as partisan or beyond partisan? Uh, well, I suppose it could be construed that way. But the way I, I, I look at it is that um, it's it's simply a, a, a sign of people awakening, people coming out of a long, dormant hibernation state. And I think uh, it has a lot to do with the fact that uh, the Lakota, as many uh, you know other indigenous people throughout the world, have... Uh, received a lot of uh, oppression, a lot of pressure, a lot of, um, uh, I guess you call it, you know, this, the pressure to conform to the dominant culture. They call it colonization and things like this. And so as a consequence of that, then people became uh, negligent 
or heedless of our indigenous uh, spiritual heritage, which which has a lot to do with the fact that in, in recent times, some of the young people have been awakening to this. And so this movement was initiated and started by um, not just young people, but uh, I would say that one, of, one of the prime movers initially were the, the kids at the school right in my community there in Wakapala about one of the initial uh, activities was a run from Wakapala across the river over to the neighboring community of Mobridge. And it was about 80 elementary kids who did that uh, K through eight primarily. And the whole idea was to just, just to create this awareness of this, um, the, the covenant, this relationship that we, that we have with all of creation, which was uh, given to the people by a holy soul uh, long ago. Uh, as you know, in the, in the writings of Baha'u'llah, there's many references to this, uh, the theme of um, progressive revelation. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the quotations, and I, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's going to be close. Uh, Baha'u'llah says, it's referring to God, says, to the cities of all nations, he has sent his messengers whom he hath commissioned to announce the glad tidings of the paradise of his good pleasure to draw them nigh unto the haven of abiding security, the seat of eternal holiness and transcendent glory. So when I, my reading of this indicates to me that this uh, process of divine revelation of, the, of God establishing a connection, a relationship with all the diverse kindreds on the planet is really unlimited. And that this great spiritual heritage that we have in North America is a gem waiting to be understood by the generality of the population. Mm. But uh, amongst the Lakota people, there was this a holy soul, a woman who appeared uh, before, prior to 1492, and she brought a covenant that includes uh, spiritual laws, social laws, and prophecies. And so I think the younger people now are beginning to awaken to this and to realize that we have this... Uh, this beautiful spiritual heritage. And part of that is, I would summarize it something like this. Um, It's the idea that everything in the world is a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality. Mm. So in other words, it's the same creator that fashioned all the worlds, both seen and unseen. Yeah. And, And so then the same laws and principles can be applied throughout these realms of creation. And so that using that, then we can see this physical world here. Everything is like a counterpart to something in the spiritual worlds. So then uh, we are, we are as human beings have a role, have a responsibility and assignment of being the custodians, the stewards, uh, the guardians of this creation. Oh, that's fantastic, Kevin. I mean, I have so many questions. Um, First of all, does this holy soul in the Lakota tradition, does she have a name? Yes, the, the name is Tehinchala uh, Skawi, uh, and in English, you would translate that as uh, White Buffalo Calf Maiden. And yeah. so, so this may be, you know, in, obviously in the, the Baha'i faith, the, in the belief system of the Baha'i faith, there's progressive revelation, like you said, that God will send, the Creator will send great teachers or holy souls, as you call them, to, to every race, to every people, uh, throughout the ages to move us forward, uh, progress us um, spiritually. And so this mm-hmm. may be the only record we have of a, of a woman uh, manifestation of God, as Baha'is call them. Well, um, you know, that, th- there must be so many, but um, I think the references in the Quran and also in the Bible uh, refer to these, these, this, these holy souls as being uncountable or myriad yeah so these holy souls that have appeared in the past and so yes the the one that appeared to the lakota was a, a woman now just um just uh, a couple of days ago yesterday i was in um i was near rochester and it's um it's uh Ganondigan, which is the uh, uh, uh a, it's it's a museum and historical site where there was between nine and 12,000 people living there in the 1600s. Mm. 
And that particular village was um, um, a Seneca village, and uh, it was it was the uh, the the residence of uh, Jikon Sase. This was the woman who, the the first person who recognized and accepted and had faith in the uh, peacemaker, you know, the holy soul who appeared amongst the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois people, mm. you know, now known as the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk. Mm. Those five. Mm. And so then, anyway, so uh, this is uh, this is one of the centerpieces of that museum. There is is the uh, is is to create an awareness amongst the visitors of this uh, the um, uh, some of the um, understandings of that covenant of this holy soul who is named the peacemaker in English. Wow. And of course, I, American democracy owes so much to those tribes, the Seneca and Oneida, because it was an inspiration for uh, creating our democracy. In, in, in some exactly. ways, it's like the world's first democracy where they had representatives of different tribes coming together in peace and, uh, you know, solving political and social issues and problems uh, together in, a, in, in council. Isn't exactly. That? Yeah, that was, that was one of the uh, foundational teachings of the peacemaker was to create a, a divinely, a divine administrative order. And there was nothing else existing on the planet. All they had in Europe were autocracies and uh, monarchies and so forth. And so, uh, the only true democracies that were existing at that time were, were here in uh, on this side of the ocean, and that was one of the provisions of the covenant of the peacemaker, mm. who instituted the, those laws that were based on service. And by the way, that you know the, uh, the the that administrative order is is has has never been uh, has never been discontinued. There's continuity up to today, and it's all it's based on uh, a person's. Uh, ability to be of service and mm. it, it's the it's because of that uh, the woman was the first one to believe in the peacemaker um the woman has the authority to uh empower or disempower the chiefs so if they're if the chiefs are found to be um uh, swerving or somewhat negligent of their duties to be of service then the um the clan leader the the woman can give uh, four war up to four warnings, and if that person does not abide or heed, then they can disempower that, take that chief out of office. But that's that's the woman's duty to do that, and that's part of the provisions of the the great law of peace. Oh, that's fantastic! There's again so many questions. My mind is kind of reeling. Um, but let's go back a topic because you brought up something really beautiful that, um, and. If, for, if, forgive me if I'm not saying it right, but what I kind of heard you say is that if you had to boil down the essence of Native American spirituality, and it's hard to you know encompass hundreds of, of tribes under that umbrella, but this idea that is very much in the Baha'i faith that we are stewards over a kind of a beautiful physical but metaphorical world that is a reflection of the spiritual reality and we're custodians of these kind of natural metaphors. Uh, you, mm -hmm. uh, am, I, am I saying that? I'm kind of extrapolating a little bit from it. Is that, is that similar to what you were saying? Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, just to give a more of a concrete example, I think when people first arrived on uh, the shores here in North America, they, um, they observed uh, the indigenous people and they made an assumption. They thought, well, these people are worshiping that mountain or they're worshiping that tree or they're worshiping the eagle or they're worshiping different physical things but it's it's really not that it's just that the uh you know this this world being a, a counterpart this physical world a counterpart to the spiritual realms it's simply that these physical these physical um entities are manifestations of spiritual reality so it's not like they're worshiping the mountain but that mountain simply is the embodiment of uh, maybe spiritual principles of uh, majesty or grandeur. So they're not worshiping the eagle, but the eagle is representational or somewhat emblematic of, uh, uh, of spiritual qualities of nobility or the ascendant nature of the human spirit. They're not worshiping the ocean, but the ocean uh, bespeaks like, like immensity 
and omnipotence and the the lim the quality of being limitless, mm. things like this. Yeah, mm. that's that's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. And how does your work as um, an artist and storyteller, a hoop dancer, traditional flute player, and storyteller, how does that tie into this uh, this key spiritual idea of the indigenous North American people? Well, you know, um, uh, what what I what I have been doing is categorized in English as folk arts, folk arts. And so just to put it in a broader context, you know, every culture on the planet has folk arts, which are simply, uh, I think it's described as uh, traditions, whether they're music or dance or, or, or storytelling or crafts, uh, these traditions that are passed along intergenerationally. And, as, and there, it's usually done informally as well. So these um, these folk arts are they represent like the core identity, the core aesthetics of that particular kindred or people, and then over time, you know that voice becomes stronger and stronger. I'd say maybe more refined, and so it bespeaks these universal qualities of the human spirit, like our the the, the longing we have to to create harmony, to create balance, to create order, to express all these things, to express beauty, to express holiness, to express uh, all these wonderful things. And it, it comes out, it manifests itself through these different arts. And so uh, that's, that's simply all I do. And so I'm, I'm always, I always hasten to say that anything that I present, it doesn't belong to me at all. Like I try and, you know, disassociate my, my own ego or identity with it. But these are simply the voice of our ancestors, you know, the ones that were before us, our grandparents and great grandparents. And they all had, you know, they had dreams, they had prayers, they had hopes, they had visions, they had, they had aspirations. And, uh, and, but they're not here today. They're not here. But, but see, you and I, we can realize and we can fulfill those dreams on their behalf. Because after all, these folk arts, they bespeak. This, this, you know, this this universal dream of of this, you know, the order, balance, harmony, and now today we're living in that day when the voice of God has spoken, and we can actually have the opportunity now to create and to manifest that vision, you know, to create harmony and balance in the world. Wow! So, your work as a hoop dancer and a flute player is using these folk arts to kind of express the the balance of your the balance and harmony of nature exactly. from, your, from your ancestors you're you're passing something on you're you're sharing something yeah exactly and so then so this is um you can look at it like we're all you know there's what 7000 different kindreds or different uh ethnicities on the planet and it's just like we've all been climbing this one mountain throughout all these since you know mankind dispersed what 60 70,000 years ago and now we've all been climbing this one great big mountain but we've been coming up it from all different sides and we were previously unaware of each other but now we've reached a stage in our in our in our mutual ascent of this one great mountain where we can all see each other and we can then the summit is is in sight and now we now realize that we can never attain or achieve that summit unless we empower one another. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, these, these, these arts, you know, whether they're folk arts, whatever they are, contemporary arts is a way that we can unify and really uplift each other and achieve that, that, that summit. And of course, you know, that, that summit is, is, uh, is the, is the universal goal of, 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 you know, achieving oneness with God from that summit. Once we reach that, we can't turn back. All, all we can do is, is, you know, like become like that Eagle and to soar together. Nice. You know, that Eagle represents nobility. And, you know, I believe as a sometime artist, sometimes I'm a cheap television hack, but sometimes I'm an artist. And uh, I do believe that all great art, that the, the, the point of all great art is to help humanity achieve a kind of transcendence to see beyond the physical realm, 
So mm -hmm. whether you're playing beautiful melodies on a plains flute or you're doing your incredible hoop dance where you have like 37 hoops spinning all over your body and in unique ways and uh, and it's really like virile and powerful and there's it's part warrior but it's part beautiful and um, or whether you're seeing a, a beautiful painting in a museum or reading a poem or you know listening to a, a an incredible song it 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 allows humanity to give a to get a glimpse of uh, the other side. Exactly. Yeah, that's our job, man. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. in that in that sense, like artists are like shamans. I I'd say so. That's what yeah. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. that's great. There we go. Yeah. I just want to say too, like Kevin. I don't know if you remember this, but. We first met each other at the Nebi Conference, New England Baha'i Youth Conference, and we were both speakers on a panel together um, on the arts and the Baha'i faith and the arts. This was like nine or 10 years ago. And I was mm -hmm. just starting on the TV show, The Office, where I was very recognizable from that TV show. And all these Baha'i youth and their friends were there, and they were very fawning towards me because I was on a TV show. and. Um, and I have to say, like, I felt so embarrassed because, but you were so patient with them and so just understanding of these, like, kind of nerdy 14 and 15 year olds are like, oh, it's Dwight from the office. And here <laughs> you are this, you know, esteemed world traveling artist with albums out and have done concerts for hundreds of thousands of people. And um, you weren't, it's not like you were being ignored or being rude, but. I felt like such a chump next to you and you were being so kind and humble through the whole thing. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you. That was great. I have a lot of great memories of that. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Was but uh, so how did you become a Baha'i? Um, I, I became a Baha'i uh, just right where I, where I currently reside there in uh, Wakapala, South Dakota. I heard about the faith from a wonderful uh, home front pioneer couple. They had moved over to, um, uh, it was just, it's just a few miles from my place there in Fort Yates, North Dakota. And uh, actually they are both from, uh, they are both from North Dakota and they, um, they, re they moved there. And so just over a period of several years, they, they shared uh, information about the Baha'i faith uh, with me. And uh, then they were, they were on, about to move and they asked me if I if I wanted to, you know, they told me, well, Kevin, you've, you know, you know about Baha'u'llah, you know about Abdul Baha, you know about the teachings about the obligatory prayer and fast and this. And uh, I said, yes, uh, yeah, he told me all that. They said, well, um, uh, you should become a Baha'i. I said, yeah, I should. And I said, well, well, how do you do that? They said, well, you just sign a sign a declaration card. Oh, I said uh, that that's that's good. Yeah, I can do that, but. If I do that, what does that mean if I sign a declaration card? Well, they said, that just means you identify yourself with the Baha'i community. And then I said, well, uh, well, well, where's the community? Because at that time, there was no community around there. I think the closest one might be, you know, Mi Minneapolis, that's 400 miles. Or maybe Winnipeg, Regina North, that's about another 400 oh my gosh. miles. So there wasn't yeah. a Baha'i community on any of the reservations nearby? Not really, not at that time. There was not. It was... Uh, it, it, it's 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 not a whole lot, you know, uh, more developed since since then. But it's yeah, there was really no communities around at that time. But uh, but I just you know I I become so enamored with even before I um I I you know before I became a Baha'i was participating in the fast. I just love the idea of the Baha'i fast because it makes that you know that really foundational law of fasting accessible to people. It's it's a, such a powerful law. Yeah, I just I just loved everything about it right from the get go. So what was that like? You became a Baha'i. You're kind of isolated out there. They left. You said. Yeah, yeah, but I I knew that uh, I, I I knew that I had to read the writings, and so then I've I've got all my books, you know, and I just would read through, and I'd you know make notes in the margins and everything. So I I've got my own reference system, so I can use the internet and find stuff, but I can because I went through it so, you know, painstakingly and marked everything off, I can find what I need to find. Just like that, um, just like that quote that I was 
uh, mentioned that accentuates what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I can read a little bit of, of it here. It says, uh, this is from uh, Prayers and Meditations, uh, page 271. I am well aware, O oh my Lord, that I have been so carried away by the clear tokens of thy loving kindness and so completely inebriated with the wine of thine utterance that whatever I behold, I readily discover that it maketh thee known unto me and it remindeth me of thy signs and of thy tokens and of thy testimonies. By thy glory, every time I lift up mine eyes into thy heaven, I call to mind thy highness and thy loftiness and thine incomparable glory and greatness. And every time I turn my gaze to thine earth, I am made to recognize the evidences of thy power and the tokens of thy bounty. And when I behold the sea, I find that it speaketh to me of thy majesty and of the potency of thy might and of thy sovereignty and grandeur. And whatever time I contemplate the mountains, I am led to discover the ensigns of thy victory and the standards of thine omnipotence. It's a long prayer, uh, Rain, but uh, you can see where I'm going with that. It just, it just, it, mm. it's in, it's, it's in the revelation of Baha'u'llah. You know this, you know the, the, the whole vision of this revelation is invoked using the, using what we experience, the natural world. This is, a, this is, a, the, our, we're limited, limited to this world, and so the revelation, this vision, is invoked by using these uh, things that, that we're familiar with in this world. Yeah, that is beautiful. There are so many uh, natural world metaphors used throughout the Baha'i uh, teachings. I, I went to a fireside once that Tom Price gave, and he, he basically the entire fireside was him going over all the garden metaphors, mm -hmm. um, and all the ways that gardens are used in the Baha'i faith, and tilling the soil, to the sun shining on the garden, to the rain making the plants grow, to the diversity of the garden adding to its beauty, all these different ways of looking at a garden. You know, there's that famous poem, 67 ways of looking at a blackbird. It's, you know, 67 <laughs> ways of looking at a spiritual garden. And of course, so I do, like I always do, is I, I stole his idea and I've basically done that fireside a bunch of times. But it's- That's great. Uh, it's very similar to, uh, to what you're talking about. But yeah, the writings, they are very specific in that sense. The, the writings of Baha'u'llah, he doesn't just say, you know, God is great. He'll say, God, like the effulgent sun in the sky, shines down its radiance upon every living creature. And that gives you a much better sense of the power of God than just saying God is powerful. Exactly. Yeah. I, I One of the prayers I loved initially was for the wrong reason, you know, because my kids are real small. Uh, my older kids are really small. And so then I loved that one about, you know, let thy rain fall upon them mm -hmm. and let the sun of reality shine upon that they breeze. You know, these, these because in, in the Dakotas, you know, we have a lot of really intense weather, any kind of weather condition you, that exists, you just add T-O-O -O at the beginning. If it's raining, it's too much rain. So I thought that's a great way to ra raise kids, you know, in the Baha'i faith, you know, you just put a little bit of a uh, little bit of cooking grease on them and put them out in the sun, let them bake. You know? <laughs> or if it's, you know, if it's, if it's raining, just put them out there and, you know, there's just a downpour. If it's, if it's windy, just tie a string on them so that they don't go hang gliding over Minnesota and just let them air out. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, that's not the right way to look at that metaphor. You know, the, the, so these children, I, you know, they're plants in an orchard and then, Whose orchard is it? And what does a plant and orchard do? Why it bears fruit, you know, and the fruit is so sweet and so so succulent, so nutritious. And, you know, just that you look at these metaphors, just like you were saying, and it's, it's so profound, so beautiful. Oh, that's great. And, you know, Kevin, I um, have told my story uh, several times and written about it in, in a book that I wrote, but... For me, it was a very profound experience when I was on a spiritual search. I had left the Baha'i faith and I was really thinking a lot about God and about faith and spirituality and trying to think about coming back in or if there was indeed a God or creator. And I was in a lot of struggle at the time living in New York City. And I read a book on Native American spirituality. I forget which one it was. And it talked about Wakantanka and... Mm -hmm. Um, the Great Mystery. And this book was a catalyst for me personally in my journey 
to have a, a, a deeper understanding of God, the creator, because mm -hmm. it was so, it was such a beautiful presence, this idea of Wakantanka and the, um, it was such a non-judgmental God. It's such a non-Judeo-Christian God. It's a God of nature and our ancestors and a God that lives beyond time and a God beyond the four directions and this kind of natural force for one to connect with. And that really opened my eyes in a new way to the idea of the creator that allowed me to, over a long period of time of many years, come back into the Baha'i faith. And since I've got a Native American authority, and I only read this one book. Of course, did I go back and really research it? No, I didn't. But I'm very grateful for the experience nonetheless. But could you talk a little bit about the Lakota view of the creator? Okay, well, um, the traditional, uh, you know, uh, pre Judeo Christian view, and this is my own take on it, is that. Um, it all derives from the teachings of this woman, this Tehinche uh, Laskawi, the white buffalo calf woman. And so um, when she appeared, the people did not call themselves Lakota, but that's a name that she gave them. And uh, they simply referred to themselves as like Pte Oyate or Ikche Oyate, the buffalo people or the uh, natural people. But then when she appeared, and it's it's a long, long narrative, but just to, uh, just to sum it up, um, she uh, she expressed herself that she had uh, been sent by Tunkashilar, the grandfather, and, and because of the grand the, the great love that the grandfather has for his grandchildren, he had authorized her to uh, to bring a portion of this love, a token of this love, to the people uh, of his love in the form of the laws and teachings that she was to present. And so then when she did appear and she, the people were gathered and she presented the, these, these laws, these teachings, essentially they're the golden rule, the same that, that are the, you know, the foundation, the foundational provisions of all the different covenants that all the people share. You know, the, cov the covenant that God bestows upon diverse peoples consists of, you know, spiritual laws, which are immutable and universal. They're, they're, they're the same yeah. ac across. Mm -hmm. And, but the social laws, each of these revelators bring that's that's different because that's really specific and attuned to the exigencies or contingencies of that particular kindred or people. Yeah. And then they also the the other thing that they all bring are prophecies as well. So this this um uh, this the woman that brought these teachings she brought them on behalf of Tunkashila the grandfather, and uh, when she departed the village she assured the people that that she would return. And that she would usher in the the appearance of of Tunkasha, the, the grandfather himself. And uh, before she left, she also renamed the people and gave them the name of Lakota. So this word Lakota, it's not really easily translatable, but it basically means people who are pious, people who pray, or people who cling to the covenant, or people who are civilized. And so. Um, you know, when, uh, for instance, when uh, Sitting Bull, who's well known, he's actually my neighbor. He, you know, his home his home site is just up the river from where, I, where my house is. And in fact, his grave is just across the river. I can see his grave from my house. But wow. uh, when he was asked to uh, to abandon his culture and to become quote unquote uh, acculturated or civilized, he simply responded. He said. He said, it's not necessary for an eagle to become a crow. That's what he said. And in, in his way of thinking, in that uh, the Lakota way of thinking, why then, you know, the, the true station of man is to be like the eagle. To be, you know, the eagle is the sovereign of the heavens. That's what we're created to soar on wings of knowledge and understanding, to be noble like the eagle. And now he he's not running down crows, you know the the birds as crows they have their place, but you know crows are just down here on the ground. They're just fighting over roadkill and trying to get shiny things and making a big racket, you know, back and forth. So all he's saying is that he doesn't need to give up his our we don't need to give up our station. And so he's uh this is the this is 
the position that they had at that time is that we have civilization. We have, as long as we hold to the covenant, we hold tight to the teachings of Tunkashila, then then this is this is good for us, sufficient for us. Because after all, who was Tunkashila? That's what I um, that's my my question. Because when you read in gleanings, you see that Baha'u'llah, you know, the House of Justice uh, in 92, they in the, the, the book on Baha'u'llah, they says, describe Baha'u'llah as the most precious being to have ever drawn breath on the planet, the supreme manifestation of God, the one who spoke to Moses through the burning bush, the one who authorized Jesus to appear in the station of the sun. So uh, in, in the Lakota language in our you know, the traditional ways, every prayer, every um, every devotional uh, um, gathering, the object of uh, adoration, the object of one's prayers is to, is Tunkashila. We, we pray to Tunkashila. Who is that? That's Baha'u'llah. Mm. That's who that is, yeah. Mm. Mm. And so that's, uh, to. I know I, I kind of looks, looks like I, I, I diverge from your, your question, but that's, that's that's really that's the way I identify it. That's how I uh, the conclusion I've come to. So that um, when we, in Lakota language, when we pray, we say Tunkashila, also Wakantanka. So Wakantanka is that a noble essence, that great mystery, the one that you know, uh, uh, that the the unknowable essence. And of course, Baha'u'llah appeared in the in the in the you know manifested. Uh, in the physical form, but he's the supreme manifestation of God. Wow, that's 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 great. I have nothing to add to that. That's that's really uh, that's really beautiful. You mentioned uh, uh, the indigenous prophecies that the uh, white buffalo calf woman brought um, that you feel foretell Baha'u'llah. And wherever you go in the world and you meet Baha'i pioneers, you're always hearing about indigenous prophecies um are there some other prophecies you can share well that one that one that i'm referring to um if you can go to god passes by and i think it's somewhere around page 100 where um uh where the guardian describes when um when baha'u'llah was when, when the, in the sia chal the uh the prison in tehran and um in which the maid of heaven appeared uh, to him, and um, the maid of heaven appeared to him and intimated his revelation uh, to him. Oh yeah, it says, uh, oh yes, page 101. He says, while engulfed in tribulation, I heard a most wondrous and most sweet voice calling above my head. Turning my face, I beheld a maiden, the embodiment of the remembrance of the name of my Lord suspended in the air before me so rejoiced was she in her very soul that her countenance shone with the ornament of the good pleasure of god and her cheeks glowed with the brightness of the all merciful anyway there's a long description that uh, baha'u'llah uh, uh, uses to describe this maid of heaven who intimated the revelation that came over him at that in the sia chal mm -hmm. so when i in my reading of the writings from the perspective of you know the Lakota tradition, immediately I recognized that made of heaven as the, this uh, this promised return of Tehinchila uh, Skawi when she promised that she would usher in and uh, lead us to the Tunkashila, the grandfather that would that would mark this road out and, and lead us into this uh, into the uh, well. You see, Lakota means peace. Also, O Lakota means peace. The condition of you know. Of, of being at one with uh, with the, with God, with the Creator, mm. and the yeah, mm. so that's how it all. I know it, it. If you, some people might say I'm a heretic, but this is just the way I look. I see it. No, no, that it sounds good to me. I I get that. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, when Baha'u'llah, his revelation is for all the peoples of the world. You know, it wasn't just for people in Palestine or people in England or America or Persia. It's it's for it has to resonate spiritually with, you know, every one of those seven thousand tribes on the planet. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it, it's it's such a fan. I've been to uh, ninety four countries now, and it's it's so fascinating to to meet with people. You know, you meet Baha'is of every different 
uh, uh, conceivable climb and language and culture. And yet, you know, if you go to, I think the most populous Baha'i community in the world is India, and they basically, their spiritual heritage that they're coming from is Hindu. And at one of the fast growing communities, Baha'i communities is Mongolia, and they come from a Tibetan Buddhist background. So they each recognize in the person and teachings of Baha'u'llah that promised one. So, but they each come from that unique perspective. Yeah, and you know, we often think of the Baha'i faith and look at the Baha'i faith through a Persian or Western perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and so many places in the world where the Baha'i faith is really coming alive, like you said, Mongolia, but in the Pacific Islands or in India, mm -hmm. you know, many indigenous peoples, I'm thinking specifically like Pacific Islanders, when they have an understanding of the Baha'i faith, it's through the, their own cultural lens and historical lens and spiritual lens. So mm -hmm. what, what is that like? What is the, um, you know, what is the cultural, historical, sociological lens that indigenous people might see the Baha'i faith through? Is that question clear? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's really clear because I think, uh, every different group has its own, uh, unique perspective just like, like you know you look at a rainbow and you've got you have to have all those colors in order to 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 uh, to see light because light is made up of all these different colors different facets and so it's it's really really enriching and um you know like even in that uh in the fasting prayer where he says you know and i'm just i'm just paraphrasing that um uh, that you know during the fast, every hour of these days is endowed with a special virtue inscrutable to all save God. And every soul has been assigned a portion of this virtue. And that's in, in accordance, again, paraphrasing, with the leaves and, and scriptures of this tab, the book, you know, the book of life. Every page, every leaf of which has been assigned each of the diverse peoples on the planet. So I think until we get all these different perspectives, all these different peoples who each, like, it, is associated with it, with a, uh, a page or leaf on this book of life, then we have an incomplete book. We're mm -hmm. missing the preface, we're missing the middle part, or we're missing the end. But as all these different peoples come together, this ingathering of peoples, and we, we have this really rich, rich base of knowledge. And just for an example, you know, like I've, I've been out in the Pacific quite a bit, and uh, to me it's so incredible to be in the Pacific because – this is like the 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 second most invoked metaphor in the in the Baha'i revelation, which is the ocean. Mm. There's like you know hundreds of uh, reference to the ocean, ocean of utterance, ocean of light, ocean of grace, ocean Words. of forgiveness. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So many, and yet here where I'm from is one of the most uh, the second most landlocked uh, places on the planet. There's a couple people places in Siberia that are further from the ocean, but other than uh, uh, other than you know, like the Dakotas, you can't get further from the ocean. Yeah. So, so then I want to find out when I go in the Pacific, what can I learn from these people who are so intimate with the ocean? You know, they, 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 for them, the ocean is just, it's like, it's like, a, a, it's, it's a familiar. Every part of it's familiar because they know the winds, they know the, 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 uh, the currents, the different temperatures of the water, the stars, everything. Is so familiar to them, and so they have this intimate knowledge of the ocean. And here, that's such a powerful metaphor. And then I, when I've been in the Pacific, I always tell them, you know, how much I want to learn from them. But then I always tell them one of the one of the metaphors that that they're not familiar with, which is a probably the second most invoked metaphor in the Revelation, is the springtime. You know, the divine springtime. We're ah. living in a a period in the history of humankind that's, that's likened them to the springtime that autumn shall never overtake. Mm. So then uh, if, if they want to know about springtime, I know about springtime because the only way you can know about springtime is it's, it's a relative term based on the intensity of winter. Right. So the, the, the intensity with which you experience winter uh, is, is, is the degree to which you can understand spring. So yeah, we really understand spring quite well. <laughs> you know, it's not something real, beautiful and nice but it's you know springtime is when you have this most uh most uh torrential or cataclysmic or this this most um you know vehement uh weather conditions you know the the you know the worst blizzards the heaviest downpours the mud the tornadoes sure 
winds, all this, you know, so it's very tumultuous, which is exactly what the way the world is right now. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. I always think about yeah. spring being so gentle, but you're right. There's a, there's a, there can be a hurricane season in the spring too, with tumultuous rains and, uh, and storms in, in March and April. Um, yeah. you got a ways to go before it gets to kind of late May when things chill out. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So th this is where we're just at the beginning of spring, you know, metaphorically in the world today, where you're looking out, you look at, I don't know, some people have on their cell phones, they have that, you know, the news thing, and you just, it's just a catalog of horrors, you know, just oh. all this corruption and this, you know, uh, environmental degradation and, you know, this, this you know, recrudescence of uh, violence is everywhere. And so people are just caught up in this. And this, you know, like this violent quality of spring, and they overlook these almost micros microscopic signs of spring, which would be like the, in the world of nature, these little tiny, you know, little little sprouts coming up. Mm -hmm. You don't see that for all the mess going on around, but you know that's what we have to focus on. We have to focus on the integrative, the co uh, forces of of the, of the of the times that we're living in now, and and align ourselves with that, and nurture that, and bring that up, which is exactly what the Baha'is are doing, you know, we have the, we know about the, the major plan of God and the minor plan, the major plan, that's all that chaos going on out there. Mm -hmm. Yet we have to focus on this, on the minor plan, which are, you know, the, the systematic efforts. Remember, I don't know, uh, oh gosh, 20, 30 years ago, they had these bumper stickers out. It, you know, it was, a, it was kind of a response to the, uh, all the violence going on, you know, the senseless violence this says, uh, commit, random acts of kindness and senseless acts of beauty. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, you know, Baha'is are all about creating kindness and beauty and order in this world, but there's nothing random about it. We have, you know, our goal is to, is to systematize it and make it very orderly, you know, and, you know, uh, regular, you know, it's, it's to, to bring it about just like in the beginning of spring or in the process of spring, you see that there is an order to it. In other words, like the the thunders and everything comes back and then certain birds come back and then certain plants appear. And so this is exactly what the Baha'is are mandated to do is to create this order in this uh, in this uh, efflorescence revitalizing process. Oh, I love that. World and today. I, and, and yeah. I, I love how, um, and I, I relate to that too, because I, I, I so love the, uh, the plan uh, the most recent plans around the core activities and the institute process of, mm -hmm. because it has that sy systematic, you know, for the first time I feel in the Baha'i community, a, a systematic uh, plan of action where um, we're all praying together with our neighbors, we're moving forward with our neighbors, we're studying with our neighbors, we're serving our children and our youth with our neighbors, and we're getting out of being a congregation and becoming a community, you know, a world community. Let your vision be world embracing, but in a systematic way. Exactly. That's right. Hey, um, how are, I know this is a really general question, but forgive me. Um, how is the, how are the native uh, communities responding to the Baha'i faith? I imagine there are, are some places stronger than others, like any place else in the world, but um, are native peoples connecting with the message of Baha'u'llah? Yeah, I think uh, I think there's a uh, uh, here and there. There's a lot of activities, and uh, you know we could uh, we could be a lot further ahead. I think it's it's possible, but I take a lot of heart in the fact that there's uh, you know one of the in, in in a lot of these clusters there's a lot there's so many human resources being developed, and I think the uh, the potentiality is there with the youth. You know, in um, in the tablets of the divine plan, Abdul Baha says. Uh, you must attach great importance to these Indians. Um, should these Indians be educated and properly guided, there could be no doubt that through the divine teachings, they shall become so enlightened that the whole earth will be illumined. So this is a great, uh, great uh, prophecy, which is right in the tablets of the divine plan. But the big uh, problem, current problem with that in the, in the U.S., especially, and also Canada, is that um, of all the different populations that reside in this, you know, North America, the indigenous population is the only rural-based population left. You know, one time all of the different populations, whether the European or African American or whatever, they were all agrarian-based. They're all pretty much rural, and cities were small. But 
now that's shifted so that everything's urban. So then, uh, you know, the Baha'i community is like 99.99% urban and the, the indigenous population is still rural based. So that means that there's a big disconnect so that the, the indigenous population is, is really off, totally off the radar of the Baha'is. But, you know, I think we're just we're just in a in a developmental stage. Uh, very soon, people will, will realize and will be able to focus more attention on uh, the indigenous uh, rural populations in uh, North America, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, especially in well in the U.S. and Canada, the indigenous population is roughly the same, but uh, the U.S. has ten times more population than Canada, and so therefore, in uh, we ex with the exception of some places like the Dakotas. For instance, uh, as an example, uh, you know uh, the 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 indigenous population is 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 very minuscule compared to the general population. But that's not the case in Canada, mm. where you have you know like in the province of maybe Manitoba and Saskatchewan, where I think now roughly one half of the school age population is uh, Aboriginal or Indigenous. Yeah. So, but we you know in Western South Dakota, that's. Uh, the the native or tribal tribal population is 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 almost the majority in most of Western South Dakota. It is the majority, all not almost. It is. Mm, mm. Yeah. Wow. Oh, cool. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so I'm just saying. I'm just saying that um, that uh, you know things are 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 to answer your question. I think kind of slow, but we're we're ready for for rapid growth anytime now. Rapid growth, but you could use some of those Baha'is coming from the urban centers out to the rural areas uh, to help yeah. these populations. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I think especially now that, you know, we're learning so much about about growth, about how to, um, you know, the, the role of tutors and the ro especially the role of, uh, you know, the uh, junior youth empowerment, that these this knowledge can really be applied and we can uh, we can advance populations rapidly now. And it's and and it should go, uh, you know, it, it should be mentioned that uh, the poverty in so many of these uh, uh, Native American reservations uh, is is just is terrible, and the unemployment isn't that the case uh, too in Standing Rock? Yeah, unfortunately, it, it's very much the case, you know. And uh, you know, one of the things that's that's very uh, uh, unusual that I'll mention is that um, most of the uh, um, Rural parts of the United States are, are are declining in population. There's a rapid urbanization process, but in so many parts of indigenous North America, you have an inverse demographic, in that uh, you have uh, very rural populations that are growing. So that, like the county where I reside, uh, Corson County, South Dakota, the median age is around oh, around 18 or 19, something like that. Wow. Whereas the adjoining um, County, let's say like Walworth County, is um, which is basically an immigrant uh, descendants of immigrants, uh, primarily German. Mm -hmm. That the median age there is is close to fifty. It's quite high. Oh, and yeah, they're cl they're closing down and consolidating all the schools. And like and over in our, in our area, we can't they can hardly build enough schools because the population's expanding, especially the youthful population. So that means we have this this huge uh, reservoir of uh, human resources you know young human resources and this is why the the uh, mobilization of um of uh, tutors and people who are you know animators is is something we have to consider now and sure. um, is there a, a native american related book or movie that you feel like people need to uh to read or or dig into to help illuminate uh uh, especially Native American uh, culture or spirituality. Yeah, you know, I, um, I think that the I always think the classic book is is this book that from the 1930s. It's called Black Elk Speaks. Mm -hmm. Black Elk Speaks, and it's really it's it's in 20 languages, and uh, a lot of people might discount it as something too fantastic. But you see, this uh, this man Black Elk was a contemporary of Baha'u'llah. And so he went in, when he was, I think, uh, uh, seven or eight years of age, and, and it was around, um, it was during the time of Baha'u'llah, and, uh, but he went into a nine-day coma, went to a coma, comatose state, where he went into the next world, and he saw this whole 
like this, uh, uh, like a theophany or, or some kind of a spiritual drama unfold where he saw, you know, this, uh, this, this rolling up of the old world order and he saw the plight of his people and he saw the eventual um, ennobling of his people along with all the other peoples. So I think uh, initially this book was just discounted as something too fantastic and too out of this world. But I think if a Baha'i just takes a look at that book, then they'll see this incredible uh, vision. I think this is the this book, uh, Black Elk Speaks, is a, uh, I believe that scientists point to it as one of the most thorough uh, documentations of a, of a near-death experience. Oh, nice. Uh, the most detailed. Yeah, but then, you know, he even describes there where he saw this man uh, standing beneath the tree of life, you know, inviting all the people beneath this tree of life. And he, he saw him, he saw that he was neither uh, Lakota or European, he had long flowing hair. And, you know, you can see that uh, this is perhaps Abdul Baha, but that's just my, my take on it. I don't want to ruin it for people that, sure, that sure. will take a look at that book. But that's a, that's a really a classic. It's, it's very uh, well written and it's, person can look through it in just a few hours. It's, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful work. Kevin Locke, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I feel like we could go on for another hour. Uh, when are we going to have the Kevin Locke book? When are you going to write a book about your, your journey and your philosophy? Well, I've been working on some mem memoirs here. It's, it was uh, commissioned by the uh, Baha'i Publishing Trust. Mm -hmm. And we do have a, a manuscript in a, at the, at the editor's office there. So uh, they're taking a look at it now as we oh. speak. And yeah, so hopefully it won't be too much longer before you get something out. Oh, fantastic. I think that would be yeah. uh, a great boon for the world. So I'm really excited. Uh, I look forward to uh, that. And uh, people, people can find out more about you and your work and your life and your performances uh, by going to kevinlock.com. Is that right? Lock with an E. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. L O C K E. Uh, Kevin. E-V-I-N-L-O-C-K-E.com. There it is. Great. And there's some videos of you doing the hoop dancing too. I, I hope that people will watch those. Oh, okay. Right. It's, I'm still doing that, by the way. Sure. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, super exciting. And you play the Plains flute. And I was going to ask you, can you take us out with a song? Can you play us something? Can, can you play us out kind of like they do on FM radio? Sure. Yeah. I'll do this song. It's about the, um, the eagle flying. The eagle's flying in the pre-dawn darkness, and the eagle is somehow uh, inspired or compelled to fly up above the darkness, goes up so high, sees the light coming into the world, and the eagle calls out and says, I am the first one to fly with the new day. And of course, the eagle is the metaphor or symbolic of the ascendant nature of the human spirit. Oh, that's great. That's gorgeous. And um, does this song have a specific name? Um, I, I would just call it the Eagle's flight. Okay, perfect. So Kevin Locke, such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for your time. I know you're a busy man traveling all over the world and, uh, thank you for, um, uh, sending us out with, uh, this song, the Eagle's flight. Okay, Rain. Thanks so much. Nice to visit with you. Thank you. I am paid to your work. 
listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much and good night. <laughs>